Welcome to CFRI's Cystic Fibrosis Community Voices, a video podcast series created by and for the Cystic Fibrosis Community. Hello, and welcome to CFRI's CF Community Voices, coming to you from our home studio in Palo Alto, California. I'm Sue Landgraf, Executive Director of Cystic Fibrosis Research Incorporated, CFRI, and I'm very pleased to welcome our viewers and listeners. We have a very special program ahead, but before getting started, I want to thank our generous sponsors, Vertex Pharmaceuticals, Chiesa USA, Gilead Sciences, Genentech, and Proteostasis Therapeutics. I also would like to note that no information presented in this podcast is intended for a patient's diagnosis or treatment. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. Thank you, and let's get started. I'm glad to be here. My name is Karen Hardy. I'm a pediatric pulmonary specialist, and I'm one of the professors at Stanford University. I was asked to talk to you today about Pseudomonas, so I've entitled this lecture Pseudomonas 101. We're going to talk about some basics about this particular organism. And I wanted to outline for you a little bit of what I am talking about. That means, how does it work? What is this story with Pseudomonas? How do we make the diagnosis of Pseudomonas? What is the impact it has on children and adults who have cystic fibrosis? What kinds of treatments do we have for Pseudomonas? How Pseudomonas affects you is related to genetics. Healthy people don't have to worry about Pseudomonas. People who have cystic fibrosis do have to worry about Pseudomonas. So why is that? It is because they have changes in their cystic fibrosis gene and that results in production problems for their CFTR. CFTR stands for Cystic Fibrosis Transmembrane Regulator Protein. And that is what's abnormal in people who have cystic fibrosis. So there are certain things we know about CFTR for certain. Those are things like it is a molecule that's going to form selective chloride channel on the apical membrane of epithelial cells within certain areas of the body, respiratory being a major one, that includes your sinuses and your nasal passageways and your airways, but also epithelial cells in your gut, in the genital urinary tract, in other areas as well. It is responsible for secretion of chloride from the cell, and it regulates activities of other ion channels, It is activated by certain chemicals called cyclic AMP or cyclic GMP, and it's mediated by phosphorylation and binding of ATP. It is deactivated by things that are going to break up phosphorylation, so phosphatases. Probably it allows movement of larger molecules too, like water and ATP through the pore, and it's involved in intracellular processes including maintaining the internal environment of various small organelles inside cells. And those are all going to be important to how well you do when you have, uh, when you have cystic fibrosis. There are different kinds of mutations of the CF gene, and depending on the mutation determines whether or not you're going to be producing any functional CFTR or not. Class 1 mutations have a major defect. All of you would know if you have this because there's an X at the end of the genetic name for your mutation. And that means you have something defective so that no MRA is produced to stop mutation. So you're not going to make the CFTR at all. So your levels are zero, so you're going to have no function from CFTR. Class two mutations have defective intracellular processing. The most common example of this is the F508 mutation. And here, CFTR is being made, but it folds in correctly, and therefore it's not going to do its job. Class 3, 4, and 5 are other forms that have partial function of CFTR. So there's some function, but it's not normal. So depending on the combination of defects you have, that will determine how much CFTR function you have, and therefore how at risk you are for the problems that result in changes in the airway secretions This is a cartoon. It's showing you the difference between a normal individual and a cystic fibrosis patient. So that normal individual, you see a couple of respiratory cells, and you can see the periciliary layer, and that's layered as PCL. And it shows this as being a little blue layer above the cell surface. And then there's a large 
hazy yellow sort of bar above, and that's the mucoid or the sol layer. So we have some gel and sol. We have all of this forming the airway surface layer. That's the airway surface layer. And that is normally space. There's a, a thinner portion to that airway surface liquid that lines the airway and a thicker portion, the mucousy portion on the top. Okay? So in this cartoon, you can see that chloride would be moving through this kind of channel, which is, is represented in yellow. And there's also an extra sodium chloride channel that's represented by the multicolored little lobules. And this is allowing chloride to leave the cell. When chloride is leaving the cell and increases in concentration above this cell layer, then water is pulled out of the cell and toward this layer. So it keeps the liquidy layer here. In the cystic fibrosis patients, you see things look different. Now the multicolored extra cellular sodium channel is bigger because it's the functional channel. You can see a little chloride not being able to get out because the CFTR protein represented in yellow has a big X on it, and it's not working correctly. As a result, you can see the water isn't coming out here, and this layer that's supposed to be the PCL is now very much squished by the mucus on top of it, and there's not enough fluid in this area. So you have this thicker, dehydrated situation at the airway surface. So the CFTR dysfunction then causes dehydration of your secretions, and that impedes mucociliary clearance. Those little wavy lines above the cells were meant to be the cilia, or the small microscopic hair-like particles that would normally be beating regularly. And they're like brooms cleaning your airways all the time. If they're not working well, then you're not going to clear the mucus. And that mucus is trapping everything you breathe, which could be cat hair and dog hair, various smoke particles from our recent fires here in California, or it could be bacteria like Pseudomonas. When the CFTR dysfunction is present, it also means the salt concentration in the airway fluids is changed, and this changes host defenses. So that salt's very important. If it's not there, it changes how your body's working. And it allows increased binding of the pathogenic bacteria. So there's adherence and early colonization of the airways with Pseudomonas, usually Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So if I say all that in clear English, I would say there's obstruction in the airways because of this thicker mucus. The mucus gets infected, and there are a number of reasons why that happens. And the salt content inactivates some natural antibiotic peptides that are in your airway. It changes how the epithelial cell would be able to fight the bacteria, and it increases the ability for the bacteria to bind to your cells. And ultimately, that infection destroys airway walls and lung tissue. So this next slide shows you a picture of a patient having a surgery because they've had destruction of tissue and they have blebs. So when you look into this operative field and you see this very shiny little balloon-like structure, that is a bleb. That's a very thin wall over part of the lung, and these things can pop. And they're happening because of somebody's recurrent infection. If we look at the next slide, you can see how inside the lung tissue has been terribly destroyed. And this is a patient with bronchiectasis from repeated pseudomonal infection. And you can see instead of a normal architecture where you have a uniform tiny tissue for alveolar uh, septi and the normal airway, you see airways that are full of mucus and you see how it's been destroyed and turned into large cystic areas of the airway, and that we call bronchiectasis. Those are permanent dilations. They cannot be reversed. So let's discuss the microbiology, the actual bacteria itself. Pseudomonas is ubiquitous, meaning it's everywhere. It lives in water and soil and any moist place. So it comes out of your tap every day, and you're, you're bathing in it and showering in it, and it's all around all of us all the time. It does not cause infection in healthy lung tissues, but it can live in all kinds of disinfectants. So you can't get rid of it in your home environment. It's there all the time. And what you can hope to do is make sure you're careful about how you're, you're dealing with your own infection control. Let me show you a little more about it. It has a different morphology, or the shape of the organism is a small rod-like bacteria when you look at it under the microscope. But it can change 
how it grows in groups, in colonies. So that colony formation is different with different kinds of pseudomonas. We'll talk about that a little bit. It has a particular odor, and it's a sweet, musky sort of smell. And after you've smelled pseudomonas a few times, you recognize them. It's very classic. So you can just smell it on a person if they are growing very much pseudomonas. It makes pigment. And the pigment that it makes most commonly is a pyocyanin, and it's a blue-green color, so that it changes the color of the sputum, and the secretions start getting green or bluey-green, sometimes gray-green. It also gram stains, which is a stain we use on all smears of slides when we're trying to look for bacteria, and it'll stain things red or blue. And this is a red staining organism. So we call that a gram-negative organism. It produces oxidase, and we can test for that, so we know we've, we're dealing with a pseudomonas. It lives with oxygen, so we call that an aerobe. And it also has beta hemolysis, so it can lyse blood cells. And it produces endotoxins and proteases. And these are things that are going to cause trouble inside a human being's body. It's a slender, as I said, gram-negative rod. It's only 1.5 to 3 microns long, which is extremely tiny. And it's motile, which means it can move. It can swim like a sperm. It's got flagella or whip-like cilia on one end, and it allows it to propulse itself so it moves around. It can encapsulate. So it can form a slimy coat that covers it, and then all it and its friends, all these bacteria, can get together covered by this slime. Sometimes it's what's called pilated. It has little pili that are little hair-like things that are coming out of it. It looks sort of furry, but then it'll have long, long cilium that are the flagella that help it move. And it grows in a wide, wide variety of temperatures from 5 degrees all the way up to 42 degrees. And that's uncommon. Most bacteria are a little more particular about what kind of temperature they like to grow in. Here's a peek for you. So this is an artist rendering of the furry kind where there are many peely. So what you see is this blue-green organism in this particular artist picture. And you see these big, long, long flagella at one end. That's how it's going to move. And the pili are these little fur-like things sticking out of it everywhere. And these are how it's going to attach to mucosa and then start causing damage. It's a clever bacteria. So it forms that outer polysaccharide coat of alginate, and we call that, when that happens, a biofilm. So it's uh, produced by the bacteria. It forms this film of slime on top of it, and that capsule allows them to hide inside and avoid destruction. And meanwhile, what they're trying to do is use those pili to attack other viruses. They detect, sorry, detect other bacteria, and then they can shoot their pili, and they have a special mechanism to actually attack other bacteria. So it's a big war inside of our airways all the time. There are a number of bacteria we're breathing in every day, and different ones are going to attack each other if they have the capability of doing that. Pseudomonas has good capability of doing that. So here's a picture of some different pseudomonas cultures and what they look like on a culture plate and what they look like in a test tube. In the wild type, I'd focus on these two. The wild type at one end, where it looks rough, and we, we call these rough colonies, and there's no alginate coat covering this, and you can see a really clear solution of it in the lower view. If you go all the way to the right, you see progressively more alginate coat, and now you see something that's totally produced of slime, and there's an orangey yellow slime over all of these bacteria. And when you look at it in the growth medium, you can see this slimy compound that floats in and out of this solution. And that's a biofilm. So what symptoms are these kinds of infections going to cause? Like all of the respiratory tract infections in cystic fibrosis, you'll see coughing. You can see regular rapid breathing. You can see an increased work or the energy used to breathe can be greater. And the sputum that's produced increases as your body's trying to fight off these organisms. You get halitosis, or bad breath, and there is this particular odor when you have pseudomonas that I mentioned before. You can get a pneumonia from this infection, and it can be associated with poor weight gain. So those can all be symptoms when you get a pseudomonas infection. 
we try to correlate what's wrong with you, what's happening in your body, and treatment strategies. And this shows a little schematic of that. So on the left side, you see the problem and what theoretically would be the treatment strategy. Well, the main problem is a defective CFG. The next thing is the defective CFTR. That's the consequence of having the abnormal genes. And that needs a protein rescue. And we are doing a good job on that now. And at our last CF meeting just last month, you heard about new small molecules that we're using to try and fix the defects in the CFTR. Clearly, this whole pseudomonas problem would be better if we did have a fix for CFTR function. So we don't have that fix yet, but if we can get that fix and we can make CFTR work the way it should normally, then pseudomonas wouldn't be infecting people. Next, there's this abnormal surface fluid. That's a result of the CFTR not working, and then we end up with too little hydration of the airway, surface lining. And there are ion channel modifiers that we can try and do other things at the cell surface to move chloride or to move sodium and to make more water come out. Airway obstruction, we are concentrating on airway clearance, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Infection, we have to think about what are the antimicrobials you can use for that infection. So what are our anti-pseudomonals? There's inflammation associated with this, so if you take anti-inflammatories, that might help you. And then there's the bronchiectasis that occurs at the end. By then, your only hope is transplant. Let's look at the next slide about standard respiratory management. Here we're going to think about infection control as a major major point for everybody who has CF and CF families. We want to have airway clearance treatment. We're often bronchodilating with some albuterol. We may be hydrating at the airway surface by using hypertonic saline. We want to clear that mucus, and so then we're going to be applying things like vests or airway vibratory positive pressure devices. We might use a mucolytic, something that's going to help break apart the DNA that is coiled and very springy. So if you think about that mucus in a CF patient, I like to think about it like a slinky. If you think about a slinky and how they just march down steps when you were a little kid, things like that. If you think about your mucus with CF, it's like it has a million slinkies in it. And when you cough, you can have that mucus move forward, but then it just springs right back because it's all a part of the slinky. If you put in that DNAs or pomazine, you can cut the slinky into a lot of pieces. So when you cough, you're going to be able to really clear the secretion. There are antibiotics, as I said, anti-inflammatories, and then there's monitoring to find out how are you in the scheme of things and what else might we do to keep you healthier. So on the infection control end, cystic fibrosis guidelines do exist. They are meant to protect our patients from each other. Isolation is one way to do that. If they never get near each other, then they couldn't infect each other. If they are near each other, they can infect each other. And in fact, cystic fibrosis patients have some of the biggest records for how far they can cough out their mucus. So the one that I know of, the biggest record I know of, is 17 feet for a cystic fibrosis male who coughed and was able to hit culture plates 17 feet away from them. That's pretty scary when you think about a CF patient being able to project things that far, but it means that you want to stay farther away than that from people who are coughing and are not appropriately covering their cough. So all the kids these days learn in school, they need to know to bring their elbow up and cover their coughs and sneezes and not do it right on their hands. They also can wear masks to protect themselves from each other. They can use hand gels and they can do hand washing. I tell every patient I see, we talk about how to wash our hands, we wash hands together and all the kids wash hands with me every time. I model what they need to do and we do it every time they see me. And usually over the course of a number of visits in a year, kids finally get it down and they start learning how to do it correctly. I work hard to have the family model this behavior and to also teach their teachers, teach the school people. Daily action for about three weeks will help you build a habit of washing your hands correctly. So that's a whole other story that I could give that for some time for CFTR. But it's a good, it's a good thing for CFRI patients and families to remember. Kids with CF in school, one child per school, that would be the ideal, and they're not going to infect any other children. But sometimes there are more than one with cystic fibrosis in a single school, and if they're siblings, they already live together, we're not worried about that. But if they're not siblings, then we worry that they come from different families, they might have different organisms, and they might share their pseudomonas with each other. 
you try and keep the room they're in all day, the places they play, the lockers they use, all of these things different, the restrooms they use. So we try and work on that with the school if a patient has cystic fibrosis. We teach the hand hygiene and we monitor with cultures and with regular visits. That airway clearance is going to be enhancing mucus clearance. You might do that one up to four times daily and 20, sometimes 30 minutes per treatment. There are differences with these airway clearance methods. Some are independent. You can do that entirely by yourself with no additional equipment. Others are dependent. They're either dependent on a big machine or a little machine. Independent methods like active cycle of breathing, autogenic drainage, the Huff maneuver. These are things you do yourself and you can learn how to do those with a good physiotherapist. They're great, especially for college and older patients who can use them anytime, anywhere they are. They're wonderful. In the United States, usually kids don't do a good job of learning autogenic drainage until they're much older teenagers. But active cycle breathing, we start on our patients at three, we start teaching them how to do that. Dependent things, PEP valves, flutter valves, acapella, the aerobica. These are small handheld devices. They supply a positive expiratory pressure. And in the cases of the latter three, some kind of oscillatory mechanism at the airway opening. And these all are going to transmit those oscillations into the airway wall to help shear the airway mucus loose so that you can get it up. And manual therapy is another way you can try and generate these same forces. Exercise is the final airway clearance that is hydrating so it changes your mucus as you're running or exercising, and it also can facilitate you moving more air and moving your secretion. So all of these things are good, and many of them have been studied, even head to head, and it's not that one is superior to the other. It is doing it that's superior to nothing. So it's important to find which methods work for you and do them regularly. And hopefully all of you will incorporate exercise into that mix. The mucolytics are things that are going to thin secretions. The pulmozyme or DNAs is inhaled, takes 10, 15 minutes to take. You can take it daily. Some people take it twice daily when they're sick or severely ill. And it's proven to decrease the infection exacerbation rate in people who are two and up. Antibiotics. So what are we going to do to attack that pseudomon? Well, we have aminoglycosides we've used for many years. Dentamycin was used initially, it was the first aminoglycoside, along with streptomycin that was out there. Streptomycin, too dangerous to use, causes too many kidney problems. Gentamycin is now very uh, ineffective, it's resistant for most of our patients, or, or their pseudomonas is resistant to this. But topramycin can be used in many individuals, it's something we use regularly. Topramycin is a cumulative problem for your kidneys. And so we watch our tobermycin dosing very carefully and we work hard throughout your lifetime so that you don't accumulate enough to get into trouble. We also have cephalosporins like ceftazidine. This is something that's a different kind of antibiotic that's going to also kill pseudomonas. The quinolones are the oxacins, so things like ciprofloxacin, and levofloxacin. These are another mechanism to kill the pseudomonas. That's a whole other group for us to use. And the nice thing about that group was it was our first oral defense against pseudomonas. Uh, ciprofloxacins are usually used at greater than three-month intervals because if you use it frequently in fewer than three months, get a couple courses of ciprofloxacin, the pseudomonas is likely to figure out how to outsmart it and become resistant. So we try to keep those separated when we're giving those medications. The semi-synthetic penicillins are also IV meds. That's like piperacillin or ticarcillin, a number of these. And all of these are then ways that we can try and attack pseudomonas. For years, we've used IV medications and typically dual medications, two at a time. There are more studies going on now to see whether we really need to do that. Is it that different if we use two drugs or one drug? There are some new anti antibiotic combinations that were just discussed in this year's cystic fibrosis meeting. Those include the three combinations you see here. All of these are beta-lactam and beta-lactam inhibitor kind of medications. So ceftazidine, which I just mentioned before, with an avibactam, or meropenem with vaborabactam, things like that. And these are all only IV. They're all working for pseudomonas. They've been used in adults 
Their safety and efficacy in pediatric patients is not yet established, and they're all new combos, and they're all very expensive combinations. But it's always good to know that there are things out there because we have pseudomonas patients who are getting resistant to some of our current armamentarium, and we'd like to have new things for them. So there are new combinations that are coming. Tobramycin had one different kind of development in the last decade, and that was the idea of a spray-dried tobramycin powder for inhalation that comes in capsules. So many of you have probably used the Toby inhaler, and this is the diagram of the inhaler that's used and capsules that are used in order to speed up the uh, inhalation of tobramycin. And tobramycin is not a particularly tasty drug, so taking it the slow way when we do a liquid like Toby, it's nice that Toby pod, which is this one, is a little easier for you to use. We also have Aztrianem, which is marketed as Kasten for inhalation. This is inhaled, sterile, it comes in pH balance vials. It will not bind the sputum, and it delivers through a new device, the eFlow kind of device. As trianum is similar in action to the penicillins, it inhibits mucopeptide synthesis at the bacterial cell wall, and that blocks the peptidoglycan cross-linking. It basically is going to destroy the cell wall function for the bacteria so that it can then be attacked. There are side effects from as trianum, so you look for reactions like rash, if you're giving it at it as an injection, an IV, you could get epidermal uh, cell destruction if you have infusion problems and your IV infiltrates. GI side effects can include diarrhea and nausea and vomiting, and you can have drug-induced eosinophilia and allergic reactions. If the patient's already allergic to ceftazidine, then they might well be allergic to astrianum, so we watch for that too. So for young children, what do we do? There was a good trial on this previously now. That was the early pseudomonas infection control trial of the EPIC study. And this was the first big attempt for young children to try and figure out what's the best way to try and attack pseudomonas early on. As soon as they get it, what are we going to do about it? Across the country, we had variability in how our CF centers were working. So some of them were using inhaled medicines for those young kids. Some were using ciprofloxacin. Some were doing a combination. Some did it for a month. Some did it for two weeks or three weeks. It was, it was quite variable all around. So with this, there was a strategy to look at, do we just quarterly treat all kids and just put them on it as soon as they do their first growth of pseudomonas? Or should we wait till they get a positive culture and we should be using monotherapy or dual therapy with an inhaled and an oral strategy. So there basically were four treatment arms in this, and there were 304 kids in it, aged 1 to 12. There were no differences in the exacerbation rates between the cycled group, who were cycled regularly, and the culture-based groups between the inhaled product or inhaled with Cipro versus inhaled without Ciprofloxacin. And there was no significant difference between the groups in the secondary very end point. Those were time to have a pulmonary exacerbation, and that required another antibiotic, whether that be oral or IV or inhaled. How well they gained weight, what their lung function was, the likelihood of pseudomonas originals of positive cultures. None of these things were different either in these groups. So in the end, we were left with, it is okay for the centers to choose these different ways to do things because all of them worked reasonably similarly. A new thing that came uh, to the attention of everyone this year at the meeting is gallium nitrate. Low concentrations of this inhibit biofilm production. As I told you, this biofilm is a particular problem for us because once it's formed, then the antibiotics can't get to the bacteria. So if we could do something to disrupt the biofilm, then we could get at the bacteria. We could hopefully kill them more easily. So this gallium nitrate protects them against the acute deadly pseudomonas pneumonia when you give it to mice. And phase 1b studies were done in, 15, in sorry, 18 to 55-year-olds with cystic fibrosis and people with chronic pseudomonas aeruginosa. They had FEV1s on over 30%. They had normal lab data. There were no serious adverse reactions. There was no renal insufficiency using this after a 28-day course, and it did kill pseudomonas, inhibited the biofilm formation, improved their FEV1, decreased the load, decreased the numbers of pseudomonas that were in the airways, and an inhaled product is being considered for larger trials. So this is something to look for in the future. 
I also heard an interesting talk just recently about TS66 and pseudomonas. So TS66 stands for Type 6 Secretion System. And this is a really fascinating story. This is how do bacteria target other bacteria and inject things to explode their enemy, as it were. And through this secretion system, bacteria that have the TS, T6SS, like pseudomonas, can put out something that looks like an arm coming right out of the bacteria. And through that, they literally can inject certain proteins into their enemy bacteria and explode, kill that bacteria. So Pseudomonas uses this to win the battle against all the other bacteria that are around it. We see this happening on culture plates because when we, when we are looking at it, it overgrows plates really quickly, meaning other bacteria don't seem to survive, but the pseudomonas is doing a great job. And that's happening inside bodies as well. So it does this by putting out this pillar, if you will, this, this uh, filamentous structure that, that is able to puncture another bacteria, explode, send in proteins, and explode that other bacteria. So researchers are working now to figure out how do you dismantle this T6SS so it won't work for pseudomonas. And in the lab, they have shown that if you stop the T6SS in pseudomonas, the other bacteria can then kill the pseudomonas. So this is really a nice thing for us to go after, right? This will be a new research area that people are going to look at to see how we can affect what pseudomonas offensive strategies are. So if you think about the, the airway and that surface film and all the bacteria you're breathing, in all the time. All those bacteria are battling each other for who's going to survive this trip into this person's lung. And the pseudomonas has been really effective in cystic fibrosis patients in making biofilms and surviving. And now we know how it's targeting other bacteria and how it is working to explode them. As they do these research studies now, you can see videos just online. If you, if you go online and look up T6SS and look for videos about pseudomonas killing, you'll see time-lapse photography of how the pseudomonas is present on a culture plate, for example, how it is treated in order to eliminate its ability to use T6SS, and then suddenly the other bacteria are killing the pseudomonas. So it's, uh, it's a great new area of interest. So in summary, we're doing better at understanding how pseudomonas has outsmarted other bacteria. We're moving to organized trials that are going to let us outsmart it. Patients are getting healthier, and we think of CF nowadays as a chronic disease. We don't like to think of it as a fatal disease. We like to think of it as a chronic disease, and we're working hard to try and treat it so that we can keep patients healthier and hopefully get them all to a CFTR fix that is going to change that internal secretion of CFTR, change that airway surface lining so that it can function better so that Pseudomonas and other bacteria aren't infecting you any longer. So if anybody has any questions, you can mail them through CFRI, and I'd be happy to answer them later, and hope you've all enjoyed this talk.